Welcome to PCR London Valves 2021. It's a pleasure to be here in Minneapolis with my two great colleagues, uh, Dr. Vinny Bipat, who is our chief of uh, cardiac surgery, surgery and uh, Dr. Paul Saraja, who's our chief of interventional cardiology. And uh, I am João Cavalcante, the director of cardiac imaging. We're gonna be talking today about a topic that I think a lot of you would be interested, which is this heart team discussion on tricuspid valve interventions. And with that, I would like to start uh, Benny asking Paul, but also hear uh, Vinny's opinion. Why was this so long time forgotten? Why, how did we forget about the tricuspid valve? You know, from, from somebody as a clinician as well, how did we get here? Well, thanks, Joel. I, I think there are many reasons why the, the valve, the tricuspid valve has been neglected. I mean, I think, first of all, it is relatively less common uh, uh, and less studied uh, because of that. It's often treated as an adjunct to left-sided disease. Uh, but I think the more serious concerns about uh, the tricuspid valve are the ability to easily undercoat its severity. Uh, when we look for TR, we mistakenly try to look for parameters that are reflective of left-sided disease but the right-sided hemodynamics are completely different. They're a quarter of what left-sided disease should be. And so the color flow imaging, the quantitation, everything, it's very different for TR versus left-sided disease. The other aspect about being neglected, there I think has to do with the fact that it's very easy to mask severe TR with medical therapy. You know, diuretics have never been shown to improve survival in any population of patients with heart disease. Yeah, we use diuretics quite frequently to treat TR. And I think it's very easy for a patient with TR to be essentially going under the radar for many years with uh, diuretic therapy. So I think, I think a lot of these reasons uh, lead to neglection. And then on top of it, we've never really had great development in terms of therapies. I think surgery has been the standard for many, many years, uh, but there hasn't been necessarily a complete focus on tricuspid valve disease. And now with newer technologies focusing in this area, I think there's an incredible opportunity for scientific inquiry into TR much more than ever before. Oh, absolutely. And, and I got to tell you, you know, when you see and, treat and take care of these patients that are taking diuretics, they hate it, right? I mean, they, they under treat themselves and then it's a very uh, low dependent valve disease and it's not quality of life at the end, right? Yeah. I mean, how can you take a diuretic and have to go to the bathroom five, six times a day? Okay. Do they present late to you, Vinny? I mean, has this been a surgery, as, as Paul mentioned, also always considered to be the reference standard, but you know, when they got to the OR, how do they look like? And so I think again, uh, uh, what Paul has alluded is really important. I think we forget that uh, valve surgery was started in 1960s, 70s, was mainly rheumatic heart disease based, younger patients taking care of left-sided disease, could remodel the heart to a point that PR was not significant in them. But in degenerative population, it's not the same. So when we see these patients for primary TR surgery, uh, these are patients most of the time reoperative. Uh, these are patients who have had left-sided procedures or a procedure like a bypass operation. So these patients always tend to be on the sicker end of the spectrum, much higher risk. Uh, but there are certain patient groups which may be first-time operations, which is uncommon, especially for primary TR, I would say, uh, but mainly pacemaker-related TRs. And these are the patients we see as surgeons. We are happier if we see them rather than the first group, which I would say. Absolutely. And so when they come to us here uh, at Minneapolis Heart Institute, but many other centers as well, you know, there is a a pathway, uh, and I would like maybe Paul you to uh, expand a little bit on how do we find these patients? Where are they? You mm -hmm. know, and and how can we also uh, you know now bring the awareness to many other centers? Well, it, it's interesting because I think they're everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you mean you don't need to look too hard yeah, to find them? Honestly, it's they're they're everywhere, and it's actually exactly what Vinny alluded to. We have gotten so good at treating left side disease that patients with RV disease and TR disease now come out and live. And, you know, before we used to just treat left-sided disease or not treated, and then that would be the end of the discussion. But now left-sided disease, cardiac surgery, transcat therapies is now much more successful than ever. And as a result, these patients with TR come out for re-ops, they come out for late presentations after mitral clip. Uh, they really are kind of this, secondary after the effect of others uh, now reappearing. And 
with aging in the population, these patients are re emerging. It's, 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 it's amazing, you know, and to illuminate uh, for the triclip, and I know in Europe, you know, triclip and Pascal and others are available, you know, these patients, it's, it's amazing, not just pacemaker, but primary degenerative uh, TR, it's really common. I never really saw much TR prolapse, but now it's, it's, it's actually 10 to 20% of our screen. And so it's, it's actually much more common than ever before. And I, and I think to your point earlier, you taught us in the CT world that, you know, TR is, a, uh, is around for a long time before the RV fails. And we have to get better instead of waiting for RV failure uh, to treat these patients. Oh, absolutely. I mean, RV failure is a late finding, right? There's a right atrial disease and then tricuspidanulus and then eventually the RV. When Paul mentioned too, you know, that these patients undergo prior operative procedures and you mentioned too, now help us understand, you know, when to address the tricuspid regurgitation when you want to go address the mitral regurgitation. I mean, these two tend to be together. Right, and what is your thinking? So I think in the last five years, the surgical philosophy has changed for sure. Um, I can tell you that adding a tricuspid procedure over already a left-sided procedure was, there was a hesitancy. And the hesitation probably was due to, are we adding mortality, morbidity, uh, more risk of pacemaker as well. We have to keep that in mind. And now the philosophy has changed. We have seen in last five years, not just because of the transcatheter work, but the interest in valve disease now, that it's easier to address it sooner. So the parameters have changed. For example, if there is moderate TR, most surgeons would repair it at present. If there's annular dilatation even without TR, uh, we don't hesitate to put rings. Uh, the ring designs are changing in such a way that it can give us the same benefit without adding a risk of pacemaker. So I think this has led to uh, four-fold increase in tricuspid repairs in concomitant procedures. I see. And uh, rather than seeing these patients 10 years later with severe TR, uh, RV dilatation, we are addressing it you know, preemptively and proactively earlier. I think that's the way to go. I mean, I think that this cutoff of four centimeters did a huge disservice to the field. Yeah. I mean, you know, where did this four centimeter cutoff come from? I mean, Joel, can you tell us? Well, I think it, it was... <laughs> You know, when you would look at that paper, um, you know, it, it turned out to be that, you know, what you could fit there, you know, with the fingers mm -hmm. and, and the measurement by true dimension of echo, you know, in a large part of what you alluded to, how do we get there to become so forgotten? It's because we know that transthoracic cardiography, especially 2D, which is the most used, it's hard to assess adequately how this, this RV is models. Mm -hmm. It's hard to assess the tricuspid annulus. Yeah. And we might be misconstructing. It's better to not provide that information than to provide the wrong information, yeah. right? Because you might be falsely reassured for something that is missed. When you dial back, a lot of these patients that you say, now it's severe TR, you look like they have been severe for quite some time. Yeah. It's just that we consistently on the call, and then they are the difficult AFibs to control. They are the half failure with preserved ejection fraction that they don't get better. There are many ways, pulmonary hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I think imaging can uh, make a big impact um, into not only educating us of you know, how much we have been missing, yeah. educating us on how we do need to use a different modality, particularly CT has been in the forefront here in our center mm -hmm. as well. And we have been using Tremensio quite a bit as well as other vendors to try to understand you know, what is the sweet spot for some of these transcatheter interventions or for some of these hybrid interventions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, a lot of this also has been allowing us to push the boundaries on transcatheter valve replacement that we are trying to also uh, continue to innovate uh, to select these patients. So when we talk about that, then, you know, what do we know at this point in time, you know, who would be the ideal patients? For example, now we talked about triluminate Paul you know, for transcatheter repair versus transcatheter replacement, or even for surgery for, for being, I mean, tell us about the well, your experience with triluminate. There, there, there are anatomical requirements for all technologies and like for triclip and Pascal and other tier devices, they're well established in terms of liquid caps and links and what have you. But I think what's most exciting is that we really don't know who's ideal for repair or replacement. And, and, and we're gonna learn a lot the next several years because the pivotal clinical trials that are being done out there are measuring TR in ways we've never measured before. I mean, 
and you're leading the imaging subset for telomerase, we're going to know how much TR correction is needed to improve certain quality of life. And I think that that is the number one answer. You know, is it all TR? Like, is it similar to mitral where we essentially have to take care of all the MR? Or is it just partial? Or what is enough to avoid RV failure afterwards? These are things we just don't know, but it's an exciting time because we're going to learn a lot in the next five years with a lot of sophisticated imaging stuff that you're leading the way to on the things that Vinny's working on. It's, it's really exciting. And you know, what are the trade-offs with each treatment? I think eventually the goal is to get a stepwise approach to any disease uh, with the toolbox. Yeah. I think that is how it's going to go. And a lot of it is going to be imaging driven, whether it's uh, imaging in terms of structure and anatomy mm -hmm. and imaging in terms of function. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen some technologies where, um, for example, annular cinching technologies and then it's hard to quantify, say, uh, what's how much is the TR later. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this is, uh, again, going to, in my mind at least, elimination and reduction is one thing. Anatomic criteria for which device will give what is one thing. This is all going to give us some easy permutation combinations by which we can choose what to do first, see the impact. If it doesn't, then what to do second. Yeah. But one thing is there is we are not going to forget it after one. Yeah. That's for sure. It's no longer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we can't allow, allow it anymore, <laughs> right? <It's, Yeah>. And <laughs> then surgery, the price, as always yeah. say, the gold standard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, he would need to end with That's this. the final word. Yes, <laughs> that's the final word. No, but I really appreciate this opportunity again to be with all of you uh, virtually here from Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis Heart Institute, along with my two esteemed <laughs> colleagues. And we're looking forward to also interacting in person when that is allowed to all of us. And with that, also would like to thank Tremenzio and also PCR London Vows for this opportunity to share with you some insights about tricuspid regurgitation. There's a lot to be learned. Um, and I think, you know, we're, it's interesting, even when you talked about the triluminate imaging substudy, from where we began, you know, a year and a half ago to where we are right now, it's a moving target, and, and naturally so, right? As we try to understand more, as we can visualize leaflets, as we can measure gaps, as we can understand RV remodeling, all of those things is a constant iterative, uh, you know, understanding that will point us towards the future directions of this field. What are the ongoing trials that, you know, what, what are they going to inform us, Paul? I mean, you know, you as leading Triluminate, uh, Vinny also the EFS and the Intrepid, what are the things, what are the knowledge gaps that we still need to address? Oh, there are so, there are so many. I mean, we're going to learn about, you know, the, well, the, the great thing about tricuspid is that uh, because the techniques and technologies that are coming out uh, in terms of percutaneous opportunities, they're safe. And, and, and because of that, that safety allows for randomization. And so uh, as preliminary is the first pivotal trial with randomization, we're going to learn so much about what effects uh, we need to achieve in terms of TR reduction to have meaningful improvement in quality of life. Uh, at the same time, we're going to learn a lot about the uh, endpoints that are necessary, whether it's cases CQ, but not just survive on heart failure hospitalization, but things like a renal failure, you know, all those secondary effects that really matter to patients. And so, um, so we're going to learn a lot, but, you know, there, there are huge gaps. We don't know who's best for TR repair versus replacement. Uh, we still have a lot to learn about this gold standard of surgery. Uh, there are some centers that are still struggling with the risk of these patients, uh, while other centers are doing well. We need to figure out how to bridge those gaps. We have uh, different opportunities in terms of uh, whether the TR should be gone or, or should be partially eliminated, or how do we predict all the failure afterwards. And then we have issues with some of the technical challenges uh, with regards to like the pacemaker patients. How do we deal with leads in the place? You know, how do we deal with large gaps or missing leaflets or multiple leaflets? I mean, we still have a lot to learn there. Uh, I can't think of a more exciting time to be in uh, TR uh, than now. Uh, it may be boring in five to seven years, but right now it's incredibly exciting. Well, I guess then let's enjoy, I think, while we have it and, and help these yeah. patients more importantly, right? Because it's bringing the awareness, is bringing the understanding that this is now a treatable disease, that diuretics are probably not enough. Uh, they hate it. Uh, and we can offer a better quality of life. 
Thank you very much again for this opportunity to be together with all of you from Minneapolis Heart Institute. It is a pleasure to be here with you for PCR London Valves. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great meeting. Thank you.